evening, folks. Welcome to uh, the Sunday night service. Great to have you here and great to be with you. Uh, we're going to sing, sing hymn number 602, Stepping in the Light, but uh, before that, let's uh, pray. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight, and uh, Lord, we just uh, want to thank you for allowing us to be here and uh, see the Word of God preached. Uh, Lord, to sing your praises. Thank you for doing what you have for us, Lord, something that no one else could do. And uh, Lord, I just ask that you bless our hearts, help us to live for what really matters, Lord, and uh, starting tonight. And Father, just uh, bless everything that's said and done here tonight. Bless the singing, bless the uh, preaching especially, Lord. Bless Pastor as he preaches. And uh, Lord, we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 602, Stepping in the Light. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, trying to follow our Savior and King, shaping our lives by His blessed example. Happy, how happy the songs that we bring. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in. Footsteps of Jesus.
Well, good evening. Hope you stood and sang and sang out for the Lord just now. We got a special uh, treat for you tonight. Um, the treat is you're not going to have to listen to me this evening. You've been doing that over and over and over again uh, on these uh, internet services. But tonight we're blessed to have uh, Brother Mike Carney preach for us. And uh, he uh, came by on Friday uh, afternoon and uh, preached a message for us. And so uh, you'll know by some of the references that he makes to the weather and things like that, that uh, he's, not, he's not preaching live. We understand that. But uh, I'm so thankful he was willing to take the time being here in the area uh, to come by and preach for us and a great challenge uh, from the Word of God tonight. I hope it'll be a blessing to you. Brother Mike and Miss Lynn have been faithful servants of the Lord in the country of Hungary, and they're home on furlough right now. And uh, they're going to, they're gonna, he's going to introduce himself and his family. They're going to sing for us, and then he's going to preach God's word. I hope it'll be a blessing to you. Well, good evening, everybody. It's so great to be with you here in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, I'm not sure when y'all are going to have the opportunity to see this video. Uh, but I will tell you that right now my thoughts are Springfield kind of missed the memo on springtime. I don't know what's going on there because it's cold this afternoon, and I'm looking forward to getting warmer. And uh, it's a great blessing to be with you, and I very much appreciate Brother Decker uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, just share what's going on in Hungary and preach to you and, and give you an update on the mission field. Uh, we've been on furlough since October and we're hoping to get back to Hungary in uh, June 24th is when our tickets are going back, but I can't say for sure if we're going to be able to do that. Hungary has closed its borders because of the virus, and they've taken a very, very cautious stance about letting people into their country from the outside rather early. And so hopefully, right now, the only people that get into Hungary are people that are actual citizens, and hopefully that will change. And so we're, hopefully we're, we're going to be able to get there in, uh, in June. So you just pray with us about that. I want to go ahead and just, uh, you know, I'm, I, I understand that, uh, uh, Brother, Brother Decker, did you all send out my video? Okay. We, we have a video, and I'll send, make sure the pastor gets that. And you'll see in our video a little bit of an update about how things have been going on the mission field and the work that we've been doing there. We have continued we have gone back to the first church we planted. The church had gone through a tough time, and we were able to get back there. And right now what we're doing is, uh, as I wanted to get back already and uh, help out with the services there and continue preaching, I have been preaching on Saturday morning with an uh, interpreter. We use him on a computer, and I record him and I uh, preaching side by side, him on a computer and myself in live. And then we upload that to YouTube, and then we present it to the church. We have a large screen TV in the church, and on Sunday morning, that's how we're doing the services there. And so that's still been going very well. And I wanted to just take a moment and introduce my wife and daughter. It's been a while since we've been here. Why don't you guys come on up here? <clears throat> I can honestly say they're the best looking people in the audience this evening. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> but we wanted to take an opportunity. And of course, this is my wife, Lynn, and this is my daughter, Katie. She's my favorite daughter. And uh, <laughs> we'd like to go ahead and just sing a couple verses of a song for you. And we're going to sing, uh, I Have Decided. We'll sing a verse in, in uh, English. We'll sing a verse in English, and then we'll sing a verse in Hungarian. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. No turning back, no turning back. El Hataroza, the Bethlehem Jesus. El Hataroza, the Bethlehem Jesus, El Hataroza, 
girls. Appreciate that. I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, start our message at this time. I'd like you to open your Bibles where you're at, if you're able to, to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And we're going to be looking at uh, verses 11 through 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 11 through 14. Now, a lot of times, you know, <clears throat> this is not uh, one of my more typical uh, missions messages, but I feel like it's a message that is very appropriate for the times in which we're living right now and for what's going on in our country and in our country back in Hungary as well and what the people are going through. And I know this is a very popular passage of Scripture, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this passage, but I wanted to uh, talk about this. And, you know, it's interesting to me because uh, I was at a church one time, and, and uh, the pastor, I was sitting next to the pastor, and another missionary got up, and he said, he said, you know, this is the first place I've ever preached this message, and I, I just felt led of the Lord not to preach my regular message, but to preach this message. And the pastor kind of leaned over to me, and he said, well, he says, man, I have to come up with a new message every service. So he, <laughs> he was kind of joking around about it. But, you know, a missionary travels, and uh, he only has that one opportunity about every four years or so uh, to share his heart with you. And so a lot of times we have a message that God has laid on our heart that we want to share with you because we want to share the burden. But I particularly had been thinking about this passage of Scripture and it's one that I, I just recently have been looking at, and I know other people have quoted it, but I'd like to look at this in Second Chronicles chapter 7, and we're going to re begin reading in verse number 11, and we'll read down to verse number 14. The Bible says here, Thus, say, thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord in the king's house, and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among the people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Let's go before the Lord. God, I just thank you for the opportunity we have to come before you. And I pray now, Lord, I know that there are people that are going to watch this video at different times. There are some people here tonight, Lord, and each one of us, God, needs you, whether it's then or now or whatever gets a, whoever gets to see this whenever they do. I do pray, God, that you would just speak to our hearts, that you help us, Lord, to be encouraged by the word. And I pray, God, that you would use me as your servant at this moment. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you know, 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14 is one of these verses that often gets quoted, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways and will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land. And I'm sure that you've heard messages on that passage of Scripture. And sometimes when you hear people talking about this passage of Scripture, they'll often reference to the fact that this passage of Scripture is uh, something that, you know, I've heard people say, well, actually, that was talking about Israel uh, in the Old Testament, and that was an Old Testament time, as if they're almost troubled that we would use it today. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. It's still for us today, and it was specifically dealing with Israel at that time, and it is true that God uh, had a special purpose for Israel and that God has his eye on Israel, and that God at that time had chosen them as a nation above all nations and had a particular plan for them. He used Israel to bring the word of God into the world. He used Israel to bring uh, the oracles of God, as it says in the book of Romans, the word of God. He used the Jews to bring that into us, God had, and God used Israel to bring the Messiah into the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I understand 
that there was a specific relationship that God had. And at this time, this was at the time of the dedication of the temple that was built by Solomon. And it was a specific time. But we can look at that passage of Scripture and we can understand that God says things sometimes and sometimes those things that we see and those things that we read still disclose to us the heart of God. We can still see that God has a burden for us. He has a burden for these things. He's going to respond to certain things. There's things that he loves. There's things that he hates. There's things that he desires. And there's people that he enjoys spending time with and people that the Bible says that literally make God sick. And so we can see the personality, the character, and the holiness of God that we can understand that the promises that he gives to one person and concerning their righteousness and their faithfulness to him, he's going to honor righteousness. He's going to honor faithfulness, and we can see that as well. Now, this statement is, is made at a time when the people were in fear because of a problem that they were having in their land. Well, I can see that now for sure. I mean, if there was ever a time in our lives, probably most of us, I think the last time we saw such a a difficult thing in our land was uh, nearly 100 years ago when they had the Spanish flu come through. And probably there's a lot of people that, uh, you know, that went through that and that survived. And I think very few of them are probably here today. And if there were some here during this time period, very few could actually remember any of the events, events of that time except for what they read and what they heard. And so we are experiencing things that we have never seen before. And we are understanding that there is concern and that people have a fear and people are afraid that something might happen to them and they might get sick and they might, have, they might actually lose their lives. But I want to tell you, it's very easy for myself as a missionary, I'm sure for you people, As Christians, I'm sure for people that are out there, to understand that there is a spiritual need in this world, and there has been a spiritual need in this world for our entire life. And maybe this idea of what's happening now has helped us to focus upon that and to realize the burden that we need to have for the people that are around us. But of course, this particular passage of Scripture is referring to a fear a fear that these people had concerning after they had dedicated the temple and having that fear that perhaps there would be a time when God would not be blessing them. Perhaps there would be a time when they would fall out of the favor with God. And we can look at this again in verse number 13. I want you to notice here. He says, If I shut up from heaven uh, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among the people. If my people, and he goes on to give us verse number 14. So he starts talking about that if there's something that goes on. In other words, if there's a time when you feel like you have fallen out of favor with God, or there's a time when you're going through that difficulty, I want you to understand that there's something you can do about it, that I have given you this place, and this place is a place you can go to where you can call upon me and you can meet together and you can bring your knees before me and you can pray and you can humble yourself and you can turn and all these things he talks about in this passage of Scripture. But what I wanted to say when I look at this right here is that we may be looking at this world right now and if you tell people that God has anything to do with what's going on now, people get concerned that you have some sort of apocalyptic uh, prophecy that you're trying to bring into, uh, squeeze into this time period in which we're having a, 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 terrible, a terrible time and a trial, and they get different ideas. But I want to tell you something. We need to understand that God is still working in this world today. That God is still doing things in this world. The God of the Old Testament is not the only time we had a God of power and a God of direction. And we can see that the Bible prophesied that God would be working in this world. We know that God has his hand upon this world. We can understand what the Bible says in the book of Daniel, where it it prophesied about Jacob's, uh, uh, Jacob's weeks, time of troubles, and the times of sorrows, and the end times, and the 
and the days that he talks about there, and he basically describes the time when Jesus would come and when, and when Jesus would be sacrificed and the Messiah would be cut off for his people and all those things are prophesied. We see in Psalm chapter uh, 22 where it really describes the events of the cross. So God had his hand on how those things would happen. We see how uh, Caesar had brought all the people from all the world to be taxed. We see how God used that to have Christ born in Bethlehem. God is still working in things today. In fact, the Bible talks about in the book of Malachi how that Israel will not be cut off. And we certainly know that there have been people and there have been times. I was just talking with somebody today via the Internet, and we were texting back and forth, and they were talking about a person that they had seen uh, years ago. It was an old movie or something. And they said, hey, this person was from your region of the world. They came. I didn't even know that. And, and I realized that they were Jewish people and that they were probably displaced from the things that happened in Eastern Europe during that time period where, where they were chased out of there. There have been people that have hated Israel. There have been nations that have risen up against Israel. And I am certain that from the time of the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD until Israel reestablished itself as a nation in 1948, there was probably scoffers that said, this, were, you know, this whole prophecy about Israel is wrong. And what the Bible says there is just not right. But, you know, it is, when it, then it became a nation once again. We could see that God's hand is on these things and that what God says in his word is true. God is still the God of power. So you have to understand that if God can change nations, if God can direct people, if God can cause things to happen in a miraculous way that were prophesied hundreds of years ago, if not thousands of years ago, that in, the, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, 2,000, 3,000 years ago, there were prophecies, there were prophecies about the end of times going all the way back to the book of Genesis. If God can prophesy those things, God has power to do something in our world today. So the first thing we need to understand and to establish is that if we want to have something done, God is the one that can do it. Now, we want to have something done. I don't know about you, I need to have something done. I not only need to have something done here in America, I pray for our leadership, I pray for our country, I pray for our uh, the people that I know, I constantly turn on uh, social media and I see people out there who are sick, uh, people that I know that have fallen sick and I get concerned about them and their situation. I have a list of people that I've prayed for who have gotten sick and some who have gotten into the hospital and I'm concerned about them. But I also want God to do something in my church. I want God to do something in my home church, my sending church. I want God to do something in the churches where I'm preaching. I want God to do something in the church in Hungary that I pastor now. I know that something needs to happen. I know that people's hearts need to be reached. I see right now in my home church, I was just telling your pastor just a few minutes ago, we were looking at our broadcasts on the live stream and there was many more people watching some of those services, people that I know, some people that I went to school with in high school that I have never visited that church. I grew up in that area, and I told the pastor, I said, those are what we call townies. Their families have been in that community for generations. I've never seen them in church. I see them watching our services. I've seen people that are my family members. I see people that are friends. I see people that have left the church and haven't been in a long time. I've seen people in other parts of the world that are hearing the gospel, some of them probably for the very first time. We need God. They need God. I see people over in Hungary. I have comments from people. I have people friending our church site. I have people asking questions. There are people that are being reached that have never been reached before. So whatever is happening in this world and whatever has happened before, right now we need God. We need God to get past the pestilence, if you will. We need God to get past the sickness. We need God to get past that part of the trial. 
But we also need God to work in the hearts of men and women who are hearing the gospel that they might get saved. We need God. Right now, we have a concern for the mission field. We, we, a lot of missionaries are stuck in places they didn't intend to be stuck. I know that there are missionaries and evangelists and people who have their meetings all canceled. I know that we were kind of in a situation where I didn't know where we were going to go next, where we were going to stay. And the Lord opened up a door for us to stay where we are now and to stay somewhere right before that. But there are people that have a lot of problems, and there are mission works right now where we normally would have a missionary there, and the missionary went home or had to leave, and there's a national, or there's very little leadership in there, and they're concerned about their ministries. And so we have a lot of people that are influenced and affected by that. We need God. We need God. If what he says in verse 13 applies to Israel during their time of drought, I can tell you right now, it applies to us. We need God, and we need him desperately in our ministries and our churches. The other thing I want you to notice here is that God's response to Solomon was because Solomon had humbly prayed before God. It wasn't that Solomon went to God and said, God, listen, I built this temple, and I just want to make sure now, are you going to respond to it? You know, nothing like that was taking place. God offered up this information. He encouraged Solomon. It was written in the Word of God so that it would be kept from generation to generation and for us today. God was responding to the humble prayer of Solomon. And, you know, it's an interesting prayer because, you know, we can't read the whole prayer. It's a very lengthy prayer. It goes on for more than 30 verses in the book of 1 Kings chapter 8. But there's a couple things there. There's something there that I found very interesting. I notice that in that passage of Scripture that Solomon was moved. He was moved by his own burden that he had in his heart. And it says in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 22, it says, And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. Now, that simply meant that they would take and they would stand there and they would lift their hands up before God. And that just showed that they were appealing to God. They were looking to God. They were calling to God. They did not have... You know, uh, they didn't have the charismatic thing that some people try to apply with that from the scriptures and say this was something else going on there. It was simply men showing that their hands are empty and that they're looking for God to fill them, to a God to answer. They're appealing to God. They're pleading to God. It is a form of very humble presence. If I were to go to you and I was to say, please, please help me, would have more impact than please help me. You know, this would really be something. And this is the way they prayed. They showed themselves as having a burden to God. But as you go on in that chapter, and you could read about 32 verses later, in verse number 54, it says, And as, as he finished his time of prayer, it says, And it was so that when Solomon had made an end of praying, all the prayer and supplication unto the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord, from nailing on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. So here's what happened. In verse 22, it says that as Solomon began praying, Solomon was like this, and he was praying. But by the time he gets to the end of the prayer, Solomon is on his knees. Somewhere in that middle of that prayer, we don't know where, when Solomon was pouring his heart out to God, Solomon dropped down to his knees and continued to pray. Solomon was not just praying for show. Solomon was not just praying that other people would hear. Oh, that was a good prayer, Solomon. One time I had an opportunity when I was pastoring up to Boston to pray for a town meeting. And people came up to me and said, oh, that was a good prayer. Thank you for that prayer. It was a good prayer. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I didn't know what to think about that. But Solomon wasn't praying so that people say, oh, that was a good prayer. Solomon was pouring his heart out to God. 
Solomon had a burden. And that burden was for God to do something with his kingdom and with his people and with his responsibility and with what he was doing. I want to tell you something. We may not be in that same exact situation he is, but we need to have a burden. We need to have a burden for our world today. I'm burdened for people that are so decisively turned to every kind of device in this world for entertainment, for every kind of way, a medium of focus and communication, and we have thousands of people that we're talking to, uh, one another on social media, and it has been a great opportunity for us as believers to share the gospel and preach, and I see a lot of things going out there, and I think to myself, some people are so angry about everything that's going on, and they just want to express everything they're disappointed in, and i got to tell you something. I don't think you're going to win anybody if they don't think you love them. If they, if they think you're against them, if they think you hate them, I don't see how you're going to get through to them with the gospel. They're not going to listen to anything you want to say. But people will talk about everything out there but God. They don't talk about the Lord. They don't talk about the burden. They don't talk about how God changed their life. They don't talk about how they got saved. They don't seem to express that humble burden for the world that we have around us. God moved in Solomon's heart, and it changed his position before God at that moment. We need to have that same kind of situation today where God works in our hearts, and it changes something. It changes who we are. It changes the position that we have. And that this passage refers to a time when Israel knew that they were going to come before God and they were going to need God. And I want you to understand that God's people had a burden. And I also want you to understand that God heard Solomon's prayer and that God responded to it. And you know something? God is still responding to prayer today. God's still willing to hear our prayers. One of the things I like to take notice of is that prayer is more than just a point, uh, 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 us talking to God. We can see that God said that if we will pray, he will respond. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. Paul told the churches to pray for him. God, Paul told the churches to pray that the word of God would be blessed. I don't think that he said that because he just wanted to give them something to do. I believe that Paul really believed that God was going to answer prayer. I see in the Old Testament when, when Abimelech's house was sick, I see that, uh, he went to, that he was talking to God. I've heard people say, well, prayer is talking to God. And it is. He goes, who else are you praying to? You must be talking to God. But it's more than that. Because when God was talking to Abimelech, and Abimelech was talking to God, Abimelech sat there and God said to him, you go to Abraham, and Abraham will pray for you. If Abraham will pray for you, I will heal your house. And Abimelech went to Abraham and asked Abraham, and God honored the prayer of Abraham. God uses prayer. It's more than just talking to him, it's a plan. And what was true for Israel at that time is still true today. God is still a God of prayer. God is still willing to answer our prayer. So if we have that burden, if we have a desire to see something and we're willing to humble ourselves before God and do something, I believe God's willing to do something about it. Are we doing on time? Okay, good. All right, amen. <laughs> I get a little bit, you know, without the, the rest of the people here, I get lost in what I'm saying pretty quick. <laughs> Let me go back here, and I want to look at this scripture once again here, because I want you to see that God worked in the Hebrew, but I want to read verse number 14 again. He says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Are you going to seek God's face? See, I was thinking about that passage of scripture, and I was thinking about that time when Abimelech heard that from God. I know it was in the middle of the night. I know that he was communicating to God, and I know that when God said that, I know that Abimelech took it to heart because Abimelech did go to Abraham. 
So I know that Abimelech believed what God was saying to him. So uh, on Abimelech's agenda was, I need to talk to Abraham. So then as he goes through that next day, he's probably looking to talk to Abraham. I don't know if he would have saw Abraham first thing in the morning. I don't know if he would have even had to wait a day or two. I don't know how he went around that situation. But Abimelech wanted to talk to Abraham. Eventually he went to Abraham. He talked to Abraham. He said, Abraham, my, my household is sick. And God says, if you will pray for me, uh, that I, he will work on your part. Um, uh, he will work in my house on your part. And so I'm asking you, Abraham, will you pray for my family? Will you pray for the healing of my household? And he went to Abraham. I don't know if Abraham prayed with him right then. I don't know if Abraham went home that night. Maybe Abraham went home that night and told Abimelech, when I get home tonight and I have my devotion before I go to bed, I'm going to sit down on my knees, Abimelech, and I'm going to pray for you. And Abimelech sat there and he went to his house and he was worried and he was concerned and he knew there was a plague upon his house. And at some point, all of a sudden, everything changed. And he said, let me tell you something. Abraham prayed for me. And I like to think of that time period between the time that Abimelech heard and the time that Abraham prayed and the, between the time that uh, Abimelech told Abraham and the time that Abraham actually prayed for him. I like to think of that time period as the waiting room of our prayer closet. The time when God is simply waiting for us to seek his face. Maybe it's now. Maybe it's now. Maybe right now with all the things going on in the world, is the time that we as God's people, are we God's people today? I say yes. Maybe now is the time that we need to appeal to God, that we need to humble ourselves before him. And then the Bible goes on to say here, he says, seek my face, and then he said, turn from their wicked ways. This is talking about repentance. Now here's the thing that's interesting. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. He wasn't telling them their land needs to repent. He was saying God's people need to have a change. As we read the word of God, you know, I, 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 I know that in the situation right now, we don't come together in a regular format. There's something about being together with God's people that is very encouraging and uplifting and it's probably hard for a lot of people out there. You may be in a situation where you have a close home and you're faithful and you're praying and you're doing all these things. I grew up in a household as a young person was not like that at all. Not like that at all. And nothing in my home said Christian or faithful or God. And for me as a Christian, I try to imagine what it would have been like at that time to not be able to go out to church and not be able to go out on visitation and not be able to go out on the youth meetings we had Friday nights and the things going on. That can be a very difficult time for some people. But I hope that wherever you are, God is still working in your heart. And if God is working in your heart, I hope that somehow there's going to be a change. We need to have God's people, first of all, be moved before they can move in the world. You know, it's interesting I was thinking about this idea of God's people. And let me just turn over to Matthew chapter 24 just for a moment here because I want to read this verse real quick. Matthew chapter 24. And I want you to look in verse number 43. And it's talking about the good man. It says, well, I'll start in verse 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord uh, doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom, he, who, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Who's the goodman? Who's been charged with the cares of this world? I think we are. I think the ministry of the local church is the good men of missions. I think that God's people, the good men of their lost families, their lost neighborhoods, their lost workmates. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 says, Let a man so account of us as ministers of Christ and as stewards of the ministries of God. 
That good man is a person that was a steward that was entrusted with something else. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 11 says, He answered and said to them, Because it was given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to them it is not given. We understand the spiritual need. We understand right now that more importantly than anything else that's going on in this world right now, there is a spiritual need. There is a spiritual need in our families. There's a spiritual need in our communities. There's a spiritual need for missions around the globe. And we understand the mysteries of God that the world cannot understand. And so we are the good men of the gospel. To us, it is given to preach the gospel and to share the gospel with other people. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to tell others? You know, years ago, I was pastoring at Lighthouse Baptist Church in Holbrook, Massachusetts. And while I was pastoring there, there was an older man that was the father of one of the faithful ladies of our church. And she came to me and she said, my dad has a tumor in his brain. And he's at the hospital in Boston. He was at the, at the Brigham Women's Hospital, I believe, in Boston. And she said, will you go out and visit? And I said, sure, I'll go out and visit. And he was Haitian by nationality. And I went out there, and I visited him. And as soon as I got in there, it seemed like everything was going on. The nurses came in. People were coming in. I couldn't talk to him. I left one of these little tracks, the track it's called the Red Book. It describes salvation in a very detailed way. I left some literature with him. I told him, please, please read that. And I prayed for him, and I left. And then I, and then I heard from him. I said, how's your dad doing? She said, he's not doing very good. And she said, they told him that they're going to have to operate on him again. And they moved into another hospital, a hospital called the Deaconess Hospital. And I went over there again, and I went in there again, and I had some more literature. It was the same thing. There was all these people there that were bustling around and moving. As soon as, it seems like as soon as I went in there, everybody and his brother had to do something in that room. And I couldn't really talk to him, but I left him a track. I talked to him. I told him about reading it. I told him briefly what the message was. I told him I was praying for him. I prayed for him. I left. He went back home. His daughter was taking care of him. I said, how's your dad doing? She said, it's not good. They said, he certainly is going to die. He, they went in there twice to get the tumor. They didn't get all the tumor. And they said, now he's too weak to go in there a third time. And it doesn't look like anything that we can do. And I told her, I'm going to come by and I'm going to go visit him. And you know what happened during that next week? She was talking to her dad. And she was actually giving him a haircut. And he said, you know something? When I was in that hospital, that Baptist preacher came by and visited me twice. And she, he said, I grew up Catholic. I never heard from a Catholic priest. She says, I like, he said, I'd like to talk to that guy again. And she was cutting his hair. And she said, when I get done cutting my hair, I want you to put my suit on me. And she said, why is that, Dad? Why do you want your suit on you? She said, I want to go over to that Baptist preacher, and I want him to tell me how I can get saved and how I can go to heaven. Well, two minutes later, she said to him, Dad, you don't have to go over to church to get saved. And just at that moment, I was knocking at the door, and I walked in there, and she told me, Your, my dad just told me he wants to get saved. And we sat down, and because of the brain tumor, he was having a hard time remembering English. And so I told him the gospel in English. She translated it into Haitian. He sat down. He called upon Christ to save him. Now, here's the amazing thing. He was 72 years old. You know what that man did? She said, she came into me Sunday. She was so excited. She said, my dad, after you left, called everybody he knew. And he said, I have been living for 72 years without knowing the truth. I've been a religious man, and today I found out the truth of the gospel. His burden, she said he was on the phone all night long telling everybody he knew. He'd passed away shortly after that. We had a church full of people. It was the largest meeting I had at my church because of the testimony of this man. All of his relatives got preached the gospel that day. Let me tell you something. We need to be burdened. We need to be burdened. We have to have a burden to see something done in our lost world today. More importantly than the sickness and the financial troubles and all the things we're going through, people need Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and go before the Lord in prayer. And as we close, I'd like you just to take a moment. And I'd like you to do this. If, if God has laid some, maybe somebody's on your heart, somebody that you're thinking about, and 
somebody you haven't witnessed to, would you take a moment right now and would you just pray for that person? Maybe you're sitting there and you're not 100% sure that you know where you would spend eternity. Let me encourage you to do something. I would encourage you to call this pastor, the pastor here at this church, or where you see in this video presentation, I'm sure there's a link to the church and you can message the church. I would message the church. I'd let them call you, I'd let them talk to you, and I'd let them sit down with you and talk to them about the gospel. But if you are saved and God is working in your life, listen, turn. Do something about it. Turn your heart over to God. Don't let it just pass by. Say, I'm going to do something for the Lord. I'm going to make a difference in my life. I'm going to seek God's face. I'm going to humble myself for the land. And I'm going to let God have an opportunity to answer my prayer because that is part of God's plan. Let's pray. Lord God, I just thank you for the opportunity we've had to be here with this church and with these people. And I do pray, God, that you would speak to the hearts of everyone that hears this message. Help us, God, to humble ourselves in your sight. Help us, Lord, to do as we should, we pray in Jesus' name.